All right, this is Physics 1B for uh, September 1st, Section 1377, and tonight we're going to talk about the topics that are listed up here. So we're just beginning this course, which means we need to kind of come up with an introduction to fluid statics. That's what we're talking about tonight. Uh, that's um, fluids that are at rest. And in order to do that, we're going to talk a little bit about gases, liquids, density, and pressure, which are very, density and pressure are very important quantities for us this semester for this class. We're also going to talk about how pressure increases when you go deeper. This is something that you've probably experienced before, that if you go very deep into the bottom of a pool or something like that, or you swim really deep in the ocean or any body of water, if you go very far down, you tend to notice that your, your ears, you feel a lot of pressure on your ears. Uh, similar thing occurs if you get on an airplane, if you drive a up a mountain if you yeah I mean any time that you have a rapid change of uh, of height above the surface or below the surface um, there's an increase in pressure and we want to learn why that where that comes from we also want to talk about Pascal's law that'll probably be as much as we can cover tonight uh, if I can introduce buoyancy at the end that'd be good but I, I don't I don't think we'll have time we have about two hours so we will do our best to cover what we can without going uh, too fast so yeah, let's get started. Okay, so let's start off by defining what a fluid is. Let me get the Discord to where I can see your chat and stuff like that. Okay, so a fluid, what is a fluid? When you hear the word fluid, what do you what do you think? I know what I think, but what do you think when you hear the word fluid? Liquid, liquids. You think liquids, okay. Is that what most people think? When you hear fluid, you think liquid? Liquids and gas. Liquids and gases. That's actually the correct answer. I always thought it was just liquids, but a fluid is actually a liquid or a gas. Okay? So, um, those are the things that we're going to be talking about here are liquids and gases. Now, prior to this point, so this is chapter 12 in this textbook, and uh, prior to this point, your textbook only discusses solids, right? You learn about how solids behave when they roll down hills and uh, things like this. But, now we want to talk about how objects that are not solid behave, and we can still describe physics of how they behave and how they how they move and, and what they do and what they do when they're sitting still. So today we're talking about the way that liquids and gases behave when they're sitting still. That's what the word statics means, right? Sitting still. So liquids and gases. Um, we, we can say something about each of these to distinguish them. Um, boy, that's probably not how you spell gases, is it? It's probably spelled with two S's. Uh, regardless, um, what is it that distinguishes a liquid from a gas? What makes them different? The way that they're structured on like a molecular level. Okay, what do you mean by that? How, what makes them different on a molecular level? Uh, well, and yeah, I like think that's the, right. Go ahead. Yeah, so it's like the the kinetic energy of their atoms or molecules. Like in liquids, it's slower, and in gases, it's higher. Okay, yeah, gases are definitely moving faster. Why do the why do the, why do the gases why are they able to move? Why are the molecules and gases able to move faster? There's less attraction forces between the molecules compared to water. Yeah, that's so exactly that, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So liquids have this feature that uh, the molecules tend to be close together. All the things you all are saying are right. Um, um, we'll just say they're cohesive. The molecules cohere to each other. They, they tend to stay close together, basically, in liquids. And in gases... Oh, and and because they stay in liquids, because the molecules stay close together, right, that, um, that means that they can exert forces on each other so the liquids can stay maintained together, which is why liquids tend to have a... Did someone say it? Someone said the word volume. Uh, liquids have a constant volume roughly constant volume, right? Gases, on the other hand, the molecules are basically completely stripped away from each other. They're, they're really far apart from each other. As you said, they move faster, and um, yeah, they're just really far apart. So because they're really far apart, they can't really exert uh, forces on each other. And so, yeah. And by comparison with liquids, I think someone said it, is said that uh, gases occupy the entire volume of its container. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so for example, if I, um, you know, if I take some amount of liquid, let's say I take a gallon of milk, for example, and I pour it into a large um, 
container, like let's say a stock pot or something like that, something big enough to take an entire gallon of milk, right? You take that gallon of milk, you pour it into like a stock pot, it's going to be how much volume is gonna of, of, of liquid will there be in that stock pot after you pour it in? So you start with a gallon of milk, you pour it into another container, how much milk is there gonna be there? Is there gonna be more than a gallon, less than a gallon? Still just a gallon? One gallon, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, what, what happens if you do the exact same thing? So if I had a, a, a gallon of a gas somehow contained in some way, right? And you were to open the top of it and then try to pour it into the same stock pot, what would happen? The gas molecules would just diffuse throughout the entire room, right? So not only would they leave the gallon container that they were contained in, but they would just diffuse and mix into the entire room that they're in. And that's because they're just going to move as far apart as they possibly can uh, and, and disperse. So gases don't really have a fixed volume. They will just always, um, you know, fill up whatever you put them into. In fact, they'll try to escape as much as they can uh, from from the um, whatever you put them into. Okay. You thought that would be because of density, Elias. Can you say more about what you mean? What 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 is that? I, I didn't pick up on what. Yes, gases are less dense than liquids in general. Yeah. Is that is that what you meant? That's something else we could say about these, is we could say that it's uh, that these liquids tend to be higher density um, than gases. If you want me to add that to the list, that's definitely true. Yeah, since gas has lighter density, it can escape the atmospheric pressure. Well, is that right? Maybe it has something to do with density. I don't want to rule that out or anything like that. Um, I, th I think that a lot of the reason why the, the gas molecules are able to escape is just because there's really nothing holding them together, you know? There's really nothing, and they move super fast, as uh, Ariana was saying, so fast that that alone can allow them to escape the atmosphere. When you say escape the atmospheric pressure, if, if they stay on the planet, they can't really escape it, right? But mo molecules can escape, oh, into the atmosphere, gotcha. So the lighter density allows them to, to float higher, if that's what you're thinking about, right? Is that what you're thinking about? The idea that like something like a helium balloon will float in the air? Yeah, okay, that's true. Like helium floats in air because it's less dense, right? So maybe they're connected. But that density thing and, and, and how it can allow these things to, I, I, I don't wanna shut down what you're saying. I think you're, I think you're on the right track. I think, I think what you're saying is, is pretty much right. Okay, so liquids and gases, Slightly different things, but they're all fluids, and a lot of the properties of fluids will apply to both liquids and gases, even though they are quite different from each other. For example, things can float in liquids, right? I, I can have a, a tub of water, and I can, I can throw a piece of wood in there, and it'll float. Um, will a piece of wood float in the air? No. But as we said, a helium balloon will float in the air, a hydrogen balloon will float in the air, uh, a hot air balloon will also float in the air. So it is possible to... Um, to experience buoyancy in both a liquid and a gas. Floating, right? The experience of floating. You can float in a liquid or a gas. You can't really float in a solid, right? Not unless it's a solid that's kind of a granular solid, like, I don't know, like a beanbag or something like that. If you want to say you're floating on top of a beanbag, but that would kind of be a lie, right? So floating is something that can only happen when you have a, a fluid, right? Um, likewise, uh, Pressure, which is going to be the next thing we talk about here, really is only going to happen for liquids and gases. There's, there's no solid pressure. Okay, so uh, that's our that's our, that's just kind of the intro to what these objects are. Now, in order to talk about these fluids, um, we're going to need certain things, specifically density and pressure. So let's talk about them and set up the variables and things that we're going to use in this class. So density is a relatively simple concept. It's often confused with how heavy something is. Things that are very dense do tend to be heavy, but their density uh, alone isn't what makes them, them heavy. They have to be dense, and then they also have to have a large volume. So the definition of density, which I'm sure most of you are very familiar with, you get by just dividing mass by volume. The one thing that may be a little bit different than in this class compared to where you've seen density before is previously you may have used the variable D for density. In this case, we're gonna use this variable rho. It's the book. It's the symbol that your book uses, but it's also kind of just the symbol that, that most 
physics textbooks use, so I'm going to cons be consistent with that. You know, if you go and, and try to get help on the internet with, um, with physics, outside of this class, you look at another textbook, you look at another resource of any kind, they're going to be using the same symbol, okay? So this symbol is not a P, it's the Greek symbol rho, okay? Which is like a curly kind of P. It's like a P that kind of curls back like this, okay? And that's our symbol for density, so kind of try to get used to that. Um, and it's measured in mass per volume. Now, in the units that we're going to be using in this class, it's going to be measured in units of kilograms per meter cubed, usually. Kilograms per meter cubed. That's going to be the, um, the unit that we use in this class. Now, you may have seen other units for density, such as grams per milliliter, kilograms per milliliter, grams per milliliter, uh, grams per cc, like grams per centimeter cubed. There's all kinds of different ways that you can express density. We're going to express it in these units because we're going to be using equations that have to have things in SI units, right? Um, but that doesn't mean it's not important to be able to know how to convert between the different types. Um, okay, so let's talk about some densities and common substances that we're going to see show up in this class. The main one that you're going to see show up over and over and over again is the density of water. Might as well just kind of commit what I'm about to tell you to memory. The density of water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. Okay. Another one that might show up in this class is the density of air. The density of air is about 1 1,000th one of this at about 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed. And uh, it goes to show you that, you know, some of these things that we're saying over here about liquids and gases, the density of li uh, liquid water is, is, is really high compared to air. Um, and uh, yeah. So one thing to, uh, I guess, ask about this. Um, why do you think it is that the density of water is exactly 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed? Does anyone know why that is? Can ask another question to kind of lead you down the right direction, but let me see. Does anyone know why is it that the density of water is exactly 1,000? Because we base the system on water, so we'll be like, we'll be how that, so? like that number. Yeah, how so? How do we base the system on water? What do you mean? Like, all life is based on water, water is something that's special to compare to like other liquids. Like, uh, that's why. Oh, all those things are true, and it certainly is something that probably led to the, the next part of this. Um, one liter is one kilogram. One liter is one kilogram. Is that right, Kate? One liter, is it exactly one liter is one kilogram? You sure? I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just, I'm just asking people. Does that sound right to you, to you all? That one liter is one kilogram? Uh, if I remember correctly, I think there's a conversion where uh, a milliliter is equal to one cubic centimeter. So I think that's the conversion they're going for, but I could be wrong. That sounds right. That sounds right. Okay, let me ask this question. Does anyone know how the what, the original definition of the kilogram, what, what was the original definition of the kilogram? Does anyone know? The very first definition we we came up with a kilogram. No. Cubic meter. That's a good guess, right? It would be a reasonable thing to guess, right? That if you take a cube and you make it one meter by one meter by one meter, and then you fill it with water, and then you just figure the mass of that, that's a good that'd be a good way to define it, right? Let's see if that works. Can you all tell me uh, while I'm drawing this cube right here? If you were to take one cubic meter of water, what would its mass be? If you took one cubic meter of water, what would its mass be? Can you tell me what that is based on these equations right here? Michael, you're... A thousand kilograms? It'd be a thousand kilograms, right? Yeah, exactly. And we can figure that out pretty quickly, right? Because we can take this equation right here and realize that we can rearrange it to say that mass is equal to density times volume, right? And then we can say that if we have a volume that's equal to one meter cubed of water, then the mass would be equal to 1,000 
kilogram per meter cubed, that's the density, multiplied by the volume, which is one meter cubed, so you get a thousand kilograms. Okay, so that's not quite right, but it's on the right track, right? So the original question was, I'll just type it out so that it's, so it's clear what I'm asking here is, um, what is the volume of one kilogram of water? I'll make this bigger so you can read it. I don't know why I have to do this every time, but... Oh, there it goes. Go to 20. Nope. There we go. And then after that, you want to answer how, if it was a cube, Okay, does that question make sense? What's the volume of one kilogram of water? And if it was a cubic volume, how long would one side be? Okay, so you have an object like this right here. You just completely fill it up with H2O all the way to the top. What's the volume gonna be? If it's, if it's mass is one kilogram, right? So the mass is one kilogram, what would the volume be? Okay, one person already answered. And you said that it was one meter cubed. How did you get that, Louis? Because that can't be right, right? Because we just we just said that if you have a volume of one meter cubed, how much is the mass? It was a thousand kilograms, right? So it can't be one meter cubed. 0 0.001, Wallace. I think that's right. So how'd you get that? Well, we have the mass. We know what the density is, right? It's a thousand. So the volume should be equal to, according to this equation, just switch the row and the V, the volume should be equal to mass divided by density. So we take the mass, which is one kilogram, and we divide by 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. Then we get a volume that's equal to 0 0.001 meters cubed, right? So that would be the volume of one kilogram of water, 0 0.001 meters cubed. So now for the next question, how long would one side be? If the volume is cubic, so this is a cube that has a volume of yeah, 0.1 meters. So if this is 0.1 meters, and this is 0.1 meters, and this is 0.1 meters, that's a kilogram. And that was the original definition of what a kilogram was you take a cube that has lengths of one decimeter. This would be a decimeter. We don't use decimeters very much, right? We just use like meters, centimeters, kilometers. But these are decimeters, tenth of a meter, right? That gives you one kilogram of water. Okay, so that's where the definition of the kilogram started. These days, that's not what we use for the definition of the kilogram. Does anyone know what we use for the definition of the kilogram these days? Up until 2015, it was a, uh, it was a, it was an actual piece of metal, but in the last five years, we've changed it. Maybe it was 2016, recently though. Does anyone know how they define what the kilogram is now in the SI system? It's okay if you don't. It's probably not super inter interesting. To you all. Well, if nobody knows, then I'm going to go ahead and assume that's not that particularly interesting to you, but I will tell you that they use a constant that you may or may not have heard of before called Planck's constant. Is that something you all have heard of? Planck's constant, Planck's constant. The symbol is H or H bar sometimes. And you may or may not have seen it in your chemistry class, depending on what you've seen. You definitely would have seen it if you take 1D. Anyway. So they use Planck's constant and uh, a very, uh, a very um, complicated uh, balance called the Kittle balance that basically balances a weight against two pieces of metal that have currents flowing through them. And uh, those two pieces of metal have a force between them. So you can balance that and define really precisely what a, what a kilogram is. Okay, so we've defined what density is. All right, done some very, very simple calculations here. Um, so next we'd like to define what pressure is. Anyone have any questions so far? So 
So to talk about pressure, let's say that we have a container. And we'll leave it open at the top. So we have a container. And let's say we fill it with a liquid of some kind. Now, inside of this liquid are molecules that are zipping all over the place. And they will exert forces on all portions of this container. And kind of the average force that they exert uh, is always going to be exerted perpendicular to the surface of the container. In addition, if you were to take another object and place it inside of here, so for example, if we were to place like, let's say, a piece of, of wood or something inside of here that's maybe shaped like this, okay? So I take a piece of wood and I place it inside of here. And just in order to make sure that it doesn't float to the top, I'm also going to use a string that we'll tie to the bottom right here. We'll just tie it to the bottom, okay? So that's a piece of wood that would would normally float to the top, but we've we've tied it to the bottom so it's forced to stay underwater, right? So the way that pressure works is there are all these little molecules inside of here, right? A bunch of little tiny dots that represent molecules, and they're zipping all over the place, right? Some of them may be moving like this direction at one point in time. This guy may be moving this point at this point in time, but it's inevitable that these molecules have to hit this object and then bounce back off, right? It's inevitable that at some point in time, some of these molecules, as they zip around, they're going to collide with this object. Now, when they collide with the object, they're going to exert a force. And because they're molecules, there's going to be very little friction. And that's going to mean that the force that they exert will always be a perpendicular force. So when these molecules do hit this object, and a whole bunch of them start doing it, right? Imagine you've got some objects and just bunches and bunches of molecules are bombarding it. The effect of that is that you're not going to feel you're not going to feel the individual molecule hits. You're just going to feel the kind of net effect of all of those things uh, acting together. And what that's going to do is it's going to feel like a force, and that force will be perpendicular to the surface. So along these surfaces, like right here, there's going to be a force acting like this. There'll be a force acting, you know, on this surface that's perpendicular. There'll be a force over here that acts that's perpendicular. And of course, these are all just forces from the fluid itself. So you've got a force like this, a force like this, and a force like this. And I'm not going to try to pretend that these forces are all the same, but I am just going to use one symbol, okay? I'm not going to just understand that there is a perpendicular force that's applied here. The fluid also exerts forces on the container itself as well. You know, there's going to be forces against the wall here. There's going to be forces down here. But we're just looking at the forces on this piece of wood that we placed in here, right? Now, the net effect of those forces acting are that whenever there is, um, you know, some kind of cross-sectional area that they're hitting, we can define the pressure to be equal to the size of the force of impact of all those molecules added up together divided by the area of the surface that they're hitting, right? So to draw a little bit more kind of three dimensions to this, if this is like a triangular prism of some type right here, right? Then this side on over here, let's make it kind of go this way, this side over here is going to have some area, right? Area A. And we define the pressure as the total force that acts on this divided by the area of that surface. And that's what pressure is. So this is pressure is equal to a force divided by an area. Now, the nice thing about pressure when we're describing fluids is it can give us a way to describe what's happening in the fluid as a whole, as opposed to going down to the molecular level and trying to figure out what all the little molecules are doing. It gives you kind of a macroscopic effect of the sum of all of those microscopic impacts. And that's what creates pressure. You're all feeling pressure right now, right? You're all feeling pressure from the air because the air is also a fluid, right? And there's little air molecules zipping all around the room. Now, granted, they're nowhere near as dense as, uh, or, or, you know, as, as densely, you know, packed as water, right? You're also under pressure to do well in school. That's true, yeah. But, you know, there's little molecules and they're, they're zipping by all the time. You know, thousands and trillions and, I don't know, hundreds of thousands. Lots and lots and lots of them are hitting your face at any moment in time, right? They're just like making little impacts on your face. And we feel that as air pressure. Now, 
you know, it's, it's not a big force, but it, it is a pressure that we feel. All right, how do we measure pressure? So the unit that we use for pressure is the Pascal, that's right. And we say one Pascal, this is named after a French, he did everything. He was like mathematician, scientist, uh, philosopher, gambler, Blaise Pascal. And I think he was also heavily involved in the invention of the first like, or some of the first um, calculators, which were mechanical, but nonetheless, they did the same thing. Okay, so one Pascal is equal to, well, it's gonna have to be a force divided by an area, right? And it's gonna be one Newton per meter squared. Newton divided by meter squared. That's what one Pascal is equal to. That's right, Louis. Okay, so you may have heard um, other units that you can use. Um, another unit that that you may have seen before is 760 millimeters of mercury. That's that's one where you use a merc. Uh, the you know we're going to talk more about that one later. Let's talk about atmospheres because that's going to be one that more people are going to be familiar with. Later in class, when we talk about barometers and how they work, we'll talk about what 760 millimeters of mercury are. A bar is also a measure. Yeah, a bar is also a measure. It turns out that one atmosphere is exact, uh, almost equal to what Louis just said, 101,300 pascals, or 1.01 kilopascals, or just 100,000. A lot of times when we do problems, I'm probably just gonna use 100,000. Now, we use the symbol P for pressure. Your book uses a lowercase p, I tend to use an uppercase p. One atmosphere of pressure, we are going to define as P naught, okay? This is gonna be, this is gonna be something you're gonna see show up in your book a lot, like in pictures. If you see P naught, what it means is atmospheric pressure. And in case you don't know what that is, one atmospheric pressure is the pressure at sea level. This is air pressure at sea level. Now, if you go up in elevation, it goes down. And you go down in elevation, the number gets bigger. Um, and we'll learn exactly why that's the case here in a moment. So that's pressure. And we can use pressure to describe, you know, certain things that you've probably experienced in your life that don't have anything to do with fluids, just as a way to get an idea of what pressure itself is, okay? So, um, let's talk about a thumbtack. So let's say that I have a piece of wood, all right? Right here, I just have a piece of wood. And let's say it's pretty hard wood, it's dense, dense wood. And into this wood, I want to push a thumbtack. So I've got a little thumbtack. Thumbtacks have a point, right? And then they have this piece of plastic. Looks, you know, roughly something like this. Not the best picture, obviously. And what happens is that what you, you, you take your thumb right here and you push on the thumbtack in that direction, delivering some amount of force, right? You push with some force. Let's call it F. And then that thumbtack, if if it's sharp enough and if you push with enough force, will pierce into the wood, right? So this is probably an obvious question, but I think it helps to ask. When you push the thumbtack into the wood, why doesn't the thumb, thumb, the part that's touching your thumb, why doesn't that push into your thumb? I know it's a dumb question, but sometimes you gotta start with a really simple question and then build on it, right? Does the question make sense? Why is it that, that the, the, the sharp part can pierce into the wood while doing nothing to your hand. Area? I'm gonna say more. What has a greater area? The thumbtack has a greater area right here, right? Right? So let's look at this equation, right? Uh, this equation says that uh, pressure is equal to force divided by area, right? Now, the thing that actually allows the needle to push into the wood is pressure. And in order for the needle to pierce into your skin, um, you know, this side would have to have a really small area, right? So when you push in this direction with the force F, the thumbtack is gonna push back on you with the force F as well, right? And the pressure that you feel is gonna be equal to a force divided by a, let's call it a big area, okay? This is what you feel. Whereas the pressure that's felt by the wood is gonna be a force divided by 
the pinpoint of these needles has a very, very, very small area, right? So you divide this by a small area. Sorry, these aren't equal to each other. What am I doing? My bad. We'll call this pressure one. They're not equal to each other. I'm, the force is the same. It's the force that's the same. The pressure is what's different. There we go. So you exert a force here, F, which means that the force that gets exerted back on you is also the force F. And then the force that's felt by the wood here is also going to be F, right? And the pressure you feel on this side, we'll call that one P1, the pressure you feel here. Would you all agree you feel some pressure when you push on it? You feel some pressure? So the pressure P1 is over here. The pressure P2 is over here. And because the area is small, right, the pressure felt by the wood is much higher than the pressure that's felt by your hand, right? Does that make sense? I feel like I butchered that explanation. It's so hard when I'm not looking at people. Okay, let me give you another explanation, right? Um, have any of you ever gone to like a carnival where you saw people that like laid down on like a bed of nails? Has anyone ever seen that? Maybe on a video or however you may have experienced this. So how does a bed of nails work? So you have usually just a piece of wood that has a whole bunch of nails that have been uh, kind of, they basically are kind of like this, right? You just got just rows and rows and rows of nails. They're, they all have to be kind of the same height. So they're all level. So a bunch of nails. I'm not going to just kind of draw enough here to make it look like a bed of nails. All right. And, um, you know, people, a person, right, could just lie down on top of this if they're careful about the way they do it. And, um, you know, they could lie down with, with no shirt on, like just bare backs. They could lie down and lying on the bed of nails, they'll stand up and there'll be no damage to their back. They won't be bleeding, nothing. And the nails can be incredibly sharp. They can be incredibly sharp. And when you lay down on them, um, nothing will happen to you, right? And what Louis is saying is the overall area of the nails is greater than a single nail. And that's exactly right. So to compare this to understand what's kind of happening here and why it is that this works. So how much force is this person exerting on that bed of nails right here? How could we describe it? How much force is a person that lies on a bed of nails going to exert on the bed of nails? What factor about... Go ahead. Their weight. Yeah, exactly. So this person exerts a force downwards. That's a weight, right? Which means that the nails also have to exert a force up on the person, also equal to the person's weight. But that weight is distributed over all of these different nails, right? Now, if you were to put the person on top of only one nail, if I have a person that li that's, that's, that's wild enough to lie down on top of a single nail, right? Then this single nail is gonna have to support their entire weight, right? Instead of it having it spread out over a large area. This person is going to have much higher pressure, which means that that nail is gonna be obviously going to pierce into their back, right? If they actually lie down on it. Although I, I imagine it's very difficult to actually allow yourself to lie down on top of the nail, right? That would be very, that'd be very hard, right? To just confidently lie down on top of a single nail. And maybe it's hard to confidently lie down on a bed of nails, but you don't have to be too confident about this because uh, with the weight evenly spread out over enough nails, then um, you'll be fine. You know, it's not gonna be like comfortable to lie on, but it's, uh, it's also not gonna really hurt because there's not gonna be enough force to push one of these nails through your skin, right? Because you, you can try this yourself. Like you can go take a nail, if you can find a nail of some kind, and just, you know, try to push it into your finger. I'm not really recommending that you try very hard or anything like that, but it still takes quite a bit of force to actually pierce your skin. You know what I mean? Your skin's not just gonna instantly get pierced by a single nail, right? So it, it takes a lot. And it's the same idea. You've got large area here, you've got small area here. The force is the same, right? So you're gonna have a big pressure over here, right? This is more like the P2, and this is like the, the pressure one that you're gonna feel, because it's a big area. When we uh, have our first lab, I'll show you guys a demo of this. I'm not gonna lie down on a bed of nails, although I would. If, if we actually had one, I would totally do it. But we have like a smaller bed of nails that has like, I don't know, like 20, and they're really sharp. 
and I'll just show you that you can put a balloon on top of that and it won't pop. And then if you put a balloon on top of a single nail, it will pop. So I'll show you that when we, when we uh, have our first lab, which is in a couple weeks. So, um, and I'll show you other demos, of course, too. I, it's good that we actually get to go on campus because I can use some of that lab time to show you some of the demos that we otherwise wouldn't really be able to do. Okay, can anyone think of other examples of this relationship between pressure, force, and area that they've experienced in their life? It's okay if you can't. I'm just, I'm just curious. Probably we, we've all probably used thumbtacks at some point. I, maybe not. I don't, I don't know. But like changing the water pressure in like your garden hose. Yeah. How does that work? Like when you you like use your thumb to cover the hole to make it smaller. Sure. And the pressure goes way up, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So. Um, that's certainly something most people have probably experienced, right? You take a hose or a faucet, put your thumb over the place where the water's coming out, and uh, yeah, you'll, you'll reduce the, the area of the opening and that'll make the pressure go way up. Water pressure in a pool, the deeper you go, the more volume of water overhead. That's the, that's the next topic that we're gonna discuss, Louis, actually, yeah. The way that the pressure goes up, the deeper we go. It's a little bit different than this topic, but it's nonetheless related. Okay, let's uh, let's keep going and let's let's talk about just what you just just mentioned here. Let's talk about variation of pressure with that. Has anyone ever used snowshoes? I have not. Someone in the first class uh, shared a picture of some snowshoes, and they work off of a similar principle, where you spread your weight over really, really big, they're almost like skis, so that you can walk on top of snow. It's another example that I can think of, at least, but I've personally never experienced that, and I know there's not a lot of snow around here. Okay, so variation of pressure with depth. So I am going to, um, I'm gonna try to uh, go through a derivation here. I acknowledge that what I'm about to do may seem a little confusing, um, but I will do my best to kind of help you through it. And our goal here is to really just prove uh, basically what Louis just said. Why is it that when you go deeper into a pool, you start to feel this pressure on your ears? Another question might be, you know, similar question might be, if you get on an airplane while the airplane's taking off, why do your ears pop? Um, and that's also something you can experience if you drive up a mountain. So um, all these questions have the same answer, all right? So we take a container, okay? And in this container, we have liquid water. It's, just, it's a liquid, okay? But we'll just say it's water. This would be work for, for any fluid. Now, within this liquid, what we're gonna do is we're going to say the liquid is at rest which is kind of a silly thing to say. So instead we'll just say the liquid is still. So imagine that the surface of the water is very calm. There's no waves churning through this or anything like that. Now, there's gonna be molecules and they're gonna be moving around inside of here, but the bulk of the water we're gonna say is sitting still. And what we're gonna look at is kind of the, the forces acting on a column of water within this object. So what we'll do is we'll take, we're gonna draw a cylinder inside of here And we're gonna say our cylinder has a height h. Okay. The areas of the end caps are gonna be a. Okay. And this is just a cylinder of water. All right, it's not another object. It is a cylinder of water within the overall volume of water. And you really have to use your imagination for this. Okay. We're imagining that we're kind of drawing a line around some of the water in the tank. Okay. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of investigate the forces that are acting uh, on this object and, and it'll allow us to solve for this idea of what variation of pressure with depth is. All right, how do we do this? The first thing we need to do is to kind of identify the forces that are acting on our cylinder. So 
if I have this volume of water right here, what kind of forces might it experience? What kind of forces might it experience? I've got a mass of water, right? I've got this mass of water. What kind of forces might it experience? Other like water mo like molecules like bouncing up against. Yeah, exactly. So other water molecules that are that are in here are going to be you know coming up here and colliding with it, which is going to create forces. There'll be forces all around. Yeah, exactly. And then gravity. There you go. Buoyant force we're going to hold off on, although you aren't wrong. Oh God. There we go. All right, so you, you all hit you you all named all of them. So one of them is gravity, right? So let's draw a vector for that one. This column of water is definitely going to have a weight. So I'll just label that as W for its weight. Not water, but weight. That doesn't really look like a W, so we'll try that again. There we go. And then there's going to be forces all around. That means that there's going to be forces on this side. There's going to be forces on this side. There's also going to be force from the bottom and a force on the top. And those are going to be the two that we're going to concern ourselves the most with. So there is going to be some kind of force acting down at the top of this column. Where is that force coming from? It's coming from all of the water around here. I'm going to label that force to be F1. Okay, That's going to be the force at the top of the column. There's also going to be a force at the bottom of the column. And, you know, we don't really know if that force is going to be the same as the one at the top. But I'll say this much. If it wasn't for this force acting from the bottom, then this column of water would just plunge downwards. So, in order for it to actually remain still, because we want this water to be still, there must be some kind of upward force that keeps it in place. Okay? And we call that force F2. Now these forces, F1 and F2, are due to the water, basically. So we'll say they're due to water pressure. And we'll also say that we know, or we want to know, what the pressure at these points are. So I'm going to say at this elevation in the water, the pressure, we're going to call it P1. And then we're going to say as we go farther down in the water, because we have experienced this before, we kind of know this is true, the pressure has to increase. So the pressure at this elevation in the water has to be smaller than the pressure deeper in the water, right? Definitely different pressures is the key thing here, right? And if the pressure on the bottom is big enough, it could support both of these other two forces. Okay, so the system is still, right? That is to say that the system is in equilibrium. Yep, and Louis is once again one step ahead of me here. Just ask the class though, just to kind of drive it home. What do we know about systems that are in equilibrium? And then Louis answered it. The sum of all forces in the y direction is equal to zero. This means that if you add up all the forces acting on the object, and we'll just do in the y direction, uh, they'll be equal to zero. It also kind of tells us that the forces acting on the left and the right have to balance out as well, right? Otherwise, the system would be moving. So, you know. But that should be okay, because we're kind of coming in here with the assumption that our goal is to understand why is it that our heads or our ears hurt when you go to the bottom of a pool. So we already know that pressure goes down with depth. It's unlikely the pressure is going to change left and right as you as you move left and right through this object, right? Okay. Now, before I continue with this, does this setup make sense to everyone? I know it's really confusing. Please ask a question if you have one. I'll wait a moment. Did you say um? P2 was less than, than P1? Or? No, no. Uh, P2 should be greater than P1. Oh, okay, okay. The pressure down at the bottom should be higher. Great question. Okay. Great question. Thank you for asking. Should have written that down. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we'll ask you a question then. What is the value of F1 according to the variables that I've given in the problem? Not in terms of W. Don't worry about the weight. Just what is the value of F1 alone? Don't use this equation. Just what would F1 be equal to? P1 times A. 
the weight of the water above it. Both of those answers are correct. So if we take the pressure at that point, which is P1, and we multiply by the area, that should give us that force. Because after all, F1 and F2 are due to water pressure. And our relationship is that pressure is equal to force over area, which can be rewritten as force is equal to pressure times area, right? And Ariana is also right that the water above here, the weight of the water above is actually what's creating this pressure. Okay, what is F2 equal to then? The force on the bottom. The same line of reasoning, it's P2A. Yep. Okay, now let's apply this idea, okay? Oh, and let's write one other thing that someone had, uh, had mentioned in the chat, which is that weight is equal to mass times gravity. Also gotta know that one. So let's put everything together here. So if we sum all the forces in the y direction, they should add to zero, right? So let's make up positive y. That means that F2 is going to be a positive force, right? And we can say F2 minus the weight, which is pushing down, minus F1, which is also pushing down. These should add to zero, right? And now we can just start doing some math, plugging things in. F2 is equal to P2A. Uh, weight is mg, and F1 is P1A. We're going to move the mg to the right-hand side. So we have P2 times A minus P1 times A is equal to mg. We can now factor the A out. So this says P2 minus P1 times A is equal to mg. Now we're very close to our answer, but there's something we have not included, which is the height. And we would like to include that as well. We want to get that in our equation, because after all, our goal here is to find how does pressure vary with depth, so we'd like to know how it varies based on how deep we are in the fluid. Can anyone tell me what I can do next? And my goal is to, I want to eliminate A, and I want to eliminate M. Okay, so you're saying, okay, let's do one step before that, Louis. We, lo we learned at the very beginning, something you all probably already knew, which is that mass is equal to density times volume, right? Density times volume. In this case, what would the volume of my cylinder be? What's the volume of just this cylinder, basically? Area times height, that's right. If I take the cross-sectional area of the top here and I multiply by the height of the column, that gives me the volume. So, putting this together with this piece here, then we can write down what Louis said, which is that mass is equal to rho times A times H. That's the mass. And now let's put that into this equation here. So now we can say P2 minus P1 multiplied by the area is equal to M, which is now rho times A times H, density times volume, that's the mass, multiplied by gravity, and now we can cancel this area out. Oops, I meant to switch to a different color. We can cancel the area out here and here, and we get our final result, which is that P2 minus, or sorry, P2 is equal to um, P1 plus rho g h. All I did was just add P1 to the right-hand side, and we get that expression right there. And that expression tells us exactly how pressure changes as we go deeper into the fluid. It tells us that if I pick two points in a fluid that are separated by a distance h, this is how their pressures are going to change. And P2 will be guaranteed to be greater than P1 because all of the quantities over here are positive. Rho is the density of the fluid, h is just how deep you are, and g is gravity. So these are all positive quantities, which guarantees that P2 is going to be greater than P1 which means that we've kind of proven the idea that the deeper you go, the higher the pressure becomes. Now, I'm gonna take this one step further and say that suppose that instead of making the column on some point below the surface, if instead we did this, 
Okay. And we just said, suppose that we make P1 the top. All right. And then I want to find at some other point down here, P2, that is a distance H away from the surface. Suppose that I want to calculate what the pressure is at this point. Well, the pressure on the very, 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 very top right here is going to be air pressure, right? This is something that's going to come up pretty frequently in problems in this class that there'll be times when they won't give you a value for some pressure, but then you'll realize that if the, the container is open to the air, then the pressure on top has to be air pressure. And as I said, atmospheric pressure, we give the symbol P naught, okay? I'm going to use, instead of using P2 to just get a more general symbol, I'm going to use P down here, okay? But then I'm just going to replace those in my equation. So P2 is going to go to just P, the pressure at some depth, is equal to, if I use the reference level as the top surface, P0, atmospheric pressure, plus, and then we add in rho times G times H. This is the formula that you're going to see more frequently, and I think is a little bit easier to use. That's not to say that this formula isn't useful, but this is the one that's going to be a little bit handier, okay? Because then, in order to find the pressure at some depth, all I do is I take atmospheric pressure and I add to it this quantity here, rho times g times h. Does anyone have any questions? All right, I'm going to leave you with a question and then we're going to take a break because we've already been going for about an hour, a little short of an hour, but um, where is it? See if during the break you can't, uh, I mean, take a break, like get up, walk away. But when you come back, spend like one or two minutes to try to think about the answer to this. It's not super hard. It won't take you that long. And uh, we'll take a break until 740. But yeah, think about this question. It says, how deep do you have to go in a body of water to feel a pressure that is double atmospheric pressure? Okay. That's the question. And all you need is this equation right here. <laughs> 